let's call them the three pillars of higher learning. Sex. Squeeze her arms. You know she wants it. Drugs. I won't go schizo, will I? It's a distinct possibility. And beer. Grab a brew. Don't cost nothing. It's time to get schooled on the granddaddy of all campus comedies. <laughs> Today's class... Animal House 101. I'm not joking. This is my job. Get the inside scoop on how the story came to be. If we could just deliver the goods, you know, it could be big. Amen. How a great idea turned into a Hollywood script. These are the heroes. Like, you know, how often in the audience like this movie? These people are disgusting. And how a great movie became American culture. Thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> Catch up with the real-life frat brats who inspired your favorite characters. Otter looked like an otter. He had teeth like that. Hear the untold stories of life on the set. McGill's got just a classic black eye. It's just award-winning. And discover the deleted scenes that were even too gross for Animal House. They had to go up and drink a lot of beer and throw up on all the fires to put them out. So grab yourself a beer and a bed sheet. It's time for Unseen Untold, National Lampoon's Animal House. It was July of 1978, and the most unpredictable event of the year was about to take America by storm. As the summer days drew to a close and students prepared for their return to school, a movie by the name of Animal House was offered to America. It would define a new breed of comedy for years to come. Animal House became one of those event movies, you know, when people lined up and there was all the excitement and anticipation. and. It was great. I mean, I just, you know, what can I say? We enjoyed the hell out of it. I don't think anybody could have anticipated that. It was a cultural change. My whole life, I wanted to be an actor, and here I was making a movie with, you know, major people like Donald Sutherland and, you know, John Belushi. Uh, I was just trying to say it was no good, but it was great. <laughs> it was a bad time. It was great. All right, hold it. Let's go back eight years. Before the movie, before Belushi, before the whole success story thing. Yeah, 1970, where the scoop on how Animal House became a movie really begins. It all started when a magazine publisher by the name of Maddie Simmons started the National Lampoon. Here we were the biggest magazine on college campus in America. And within two years, we were the number two newsstand magazine in America. By its fifth year, the magazine had upped its circulation to a million readers throughout America and Canada. But it was one particular reader who would take the Lampoon name to even greater heights. I was a fan of the magazine. I bought it every month, and it spoke to me in my generation. And I always felt that if that voice could be translated into films, it would have extraordinary national appeal. Ivan picked up his phone and placed a call. He was determined to make a movie. I called up Matty Simmons at the National Lampoon. I actually looked up his name on the masthead of the National Lampoon magazine and said, oh, well, this guy's the boss, so I'll call him up. I met with Ivan. I was very impressed. I think Ivan's very bright. And he said, we're really looking to have someone produce for us. We started a show called the National Lampoon Show. And one of the stars of the show was Harold Ramis. We did a, a touring show, which then opened off-Broadway in New York. And that show brought to America Chevy Chase, John Belushi, Bill Murray, Gilda Radner, and uh, Harold Ramis, and uh, Brian Doyle Murray, Bill's brother. I don't get off on any of this, yeah. man. Yeah, too bad. Reitman thrived in his role as producer of the stage show, and the show gained instant popularity behind the credo, go too far. But when the nucleus of Ivan's cast helped launch a new hit show called Saturday Night Live, Ivan realized he had not yet gone far enough. He still wanted to make a movie. My deal with the National Lampoon was that 
I could be a producer of any movie that was based on that stage show. And Lorne Michaels had picked up most of the cast, but he did not pick up Harold Ramis. So I went to Harold and I said, well, let's go write a movie based on our stage show. Ivan wanted to do a movie based on the show material. I spoke to Harold and Harold said, well, you know, I've been talking to Ivan about doing a movie. As a matter of fact, we're talking about doing something. So I said, well, let's join forces. Harold teamed up with National Lampoon funny man Doug Kenny, and the duo set out to write the first ever National Lampoon movie. We wrote uh, a picture called Laser Orgy Girls, which was uh, about Charles Manson in high school. This was a very, we thought this would go for really big. You know, you got everybody here is getting drunk and, and having sex and uh, doing dope. I said, oh, I, I, we'll get lynched if we do this in high school. I said, we're going to move this to college. We started talking about fraternities, and that's when Chris Miller got involved. Chris Miller was the National Lampoon writer that was famous for these college and mostly fraternity-based stories like Pinto's First Leg. I think it's locked or something. I think it was Doug Kenny who said, well, if we're going to do fraternity stories, we have to bring in Chris. He's the specialist. And Doug said, Chris, we think you are our find of the year. And I, me? And he said, yep. When Spike TV returns, the National Lampoon Dream Team sets out to make a movie. Yeah, we had a lot of trouble getting this movie made. And later, never before seen footage of director John Landis in his deleted role. <laughs> this is Unseen Untold, National Lampoon's Animal House on Spike TV. In 1975, the magazine mogul known as the National Lampoon set its sights on making its first movie. It became the task of Lampoon writers Harold Ramis, Chris Miller, and Doug Kenny to sit down and start creating an American classic. It's interesting how Harold Ramis and Chris and Doug were this wonderful balance together and that each of them had sort of a unique contribution and by mixing the three of them together, we created this sort of uh, the extraordinary language of Animal House. Then as of this moment, they're on double secret probation. Double secret probation, sir? We began by getting together and telling each other all our favorite college stories. We told every college anecdote we could remember, everything we'd ever thought, heard, felt, seen. It was great. It was just hanging out with two really funny guys. And from that, we started to weave a storyline. Well, I'm here to pick up my date. Could you ring Fawn Leibowitz for me? There is, for instance, a, story, a moment in Animal House in which Otter tries to get a date with Fawn Leibowitz, knowing full well that Fawn Leibowitz died. A sophomore dies in kill an explosion? But they felt so bad for this guy who was just now learning that his girlfriend had died that they wound up going out with the guys. Well, that really happened. The most intriguing character as we all know from our reading, was Satan. I think we all made contributions from our, our own college experiences. If you look, you know, I was talking about orientation, my first short, which I did at college. There's a whole story, you know, based on, um, you know, a teacher and a relationship with some of the kids. And that really ended up to be the Donald Sutherland character. Now, I'm waiting for reports from some of you. I'm not joking. This is my job. Parts of the movie that are most me are the scene where they smoke the joint with the teacher. I won't go schizo, will I? It's a distinct possibility. And the road trip. What's going on? They confiscated everything, even the stuff we didn't steal. What are we going to do? Road, road trip. I love the road trip. That was a big part of college life for us, was jumping into someone's car, driving to a distant school. This fruitless attempt to pick up women you know, and, and the disastrous consequences. Do you mind if we dance with your dates? And the, the actual event that's in the movie, uh, can we dance with your dates, <laughs> is a moment in the film when the, uh, the, the guys abandon the girls they picked up. Uh, that actually happened to me and my friends in St. Louis. Please be careful! Please be careful! It's gonna cost hundreds of dollars to pay! With all these tales of chasing tales spilling off the page, Chris, Doug, and Harold began creating the wily cast of characters that would make up Delta Tau Chi. Pinto, Flounder, Hoover, D-Day, Boone, and Otter. Chris Miller 
knew a guy called Otter who was a total ass man, as we used to say in those days. Gonna hump our brains out, aren't you? Boone, I anticipate a deeply religious experience. Real Otter was uh, my hero. He was a senior when I was a sophomore. Otter did this. He did this with his neck. When he danced, he did this. Unlike Tim Matheson, Otter looked like an otter. He had teeth. <laughs> My nickname was Pinto. Why Pinto? Why not? And probably like the Tom Hall's character, I was rather innocent, rather naive. I saw Pinto as myself as a freshman and uh, Boone as myself as a senior. The uh, jaded reprobate who uh, didn't take anything seriously. We're willing to trade looks for a certain kind of morally casual attitude. Oh, you mean you want somebody you can screw on the first date? Well put. That was me as a senior. That may still be me today. Do the Bluto, do the Bluto. And then came the biggest animal of them all. Bluto. Do the Bluto. They talked the bar! Grab a brew. Don't cost nothing. <laughs> I'm a zit. Get it? Bluto was a composite of uh, the wildest guys who we knew. We all had a Bluto in our lives, you know, more than one in a lot of cases. There had been, at Dartmouth, a guy called Bluto, and he was called Bluto because he looked like the Bluto who was from Popeye, which is to say he had a huge body and huge arms and a small head. The day we were searching for a name for our main animal character and uh, I said, well, we had a guy named Bluto and Doug Kenny laughed and fell out of his chair and became Bluto. After two years of writing, the Animal House script was finally ready for the studios. But Hollywood didn't jump at the chance to make a film about college kids drinking till they die and smoking till they're high. Interestingly enough, you know, we had a lot of trouble getting this movie made. I was turned down by eight directors who didn't want to touch the movie. Executives were just shaking their heads saying, you know, these are the heroes. Like, you know, I just, how can an audience like this movie? These people are disgusting. Then two young executives from Universal got their hands on the script. And unlike any executives before them, they liked it. Our generation of executives, Tom Mountain, Sean Daniels, said, no, this is really going to work. This is going to happen. And, you know, they understood it. Sean and Tom arranged for a meeting with Ned Tannen, Universal's president of motion pictures. It was one last opportunity for the Lampoon to sell its script. He looked at me and he said, I hate this. He said, this is the worst pile of junk I've ever seen. He said, people getting drunk, everything is going on. He said, Are these, you hate these people. He said, they're just awful. He said, but it's a Lampoon movie. And remember, we were very, very hot at that time. He said, can you make this movie for less than $3 million? They thought, well, as long as we make it cheaply enough, perhaps we can give these guys a shot to make the movie. I knew nothing about the movie business. I didn't know whether you could make this movie for $3 million or $30 million or $2 million or whatever. And I said, absolutely, I guarantee it. When Unseen Untold returns, the cast of Animal House answers the cattle call. I think it got down to me and Meatloaf for the part of uh, Flounder. <laughs> This is Unseen Untold, National Lampoon's Animal House on Spike TV. Animal House was going to become a movie, and Universal began its search for a director that would bring it to life. Despite interest from both Harold Ramis and Ivan Reitman to take the helm, the studio opted for a 27-year-old high school dropout in an ape suit. On the dawn of man comes luck. John Landis evolved onto the Hollywood scene after directing and starring in his first film, Schlock. When the studio executives caught a preview of his second film, the Kentucky Fried Movie, they knew they'd found the man for the job. But how do I use zinc oxide? To me, the most amazing thing about being hired on Animal House is that Kentucky Fried hadn't come out yet. That brassiere you're wearing, your artificial limb. In fact, it was a tremendously successful film. But they hired me before it came out. So it just shows what a low priority the picture was at the studio. 
Within months of being hired, John began searching for the perfect cast of frat boys. When we started casting, they were very clear we had to get names. We had to definitely deliver Chevy Chase and, and John Belushi because the part of Otter was written for Chevy and the part of uh, Bluto was written for John. Remember, Belushi had been associated with the National Lampoon for four years. So Bluto was always John Belushi, always John Belushi. There was never any thought of anybody else. D-Day was written for Dan Aykroyd, who is a motorhead and a biker, and uh, there's a lot of D-Day in Danny. Bill Murray wanted to play Boone, and Chevy wanted to play Otter. But as they became famous on Saturday Night Live, we felt, well, we don't want to make this into a Saturday Night Live movie. I was anxious not to have Chevy in this movie. I like Chevy, and I've worked with him several times, and I think he's very funny, but I felt he would hurt the movie because he was Chevy Chase, as opposed to Otter, you know, Eric Stratton. We talked to Chevy, and uh, I think John did, actually. I would say things like, you know what's really great, Chevy, is it's an ensemble piece, just like Saturday Night Live. Whereas the other, you're co-starring with, you know, Goldie Hawn, a beautiful movie star. It's just you two. So you don't want to do that. You don't, because that's like a leading man, Cary Grant kind of role. And he took the starring role in Foul Play, which was the springboard for his star. With only John Belushi on board to play the part of Bluto, the filmmakers turned to casting director Michael Chinich to help find serious young actors to fill the roles. We were basically just looking for the right match. You know, somebody who had talent, had the right physical characteristics, had a, a way about them. Hi, Eric Stratton, Russ Sherman. Damn glad to meet you. I just knew that this was the movie that I wanted to be in more than anything. And the word came back, no, they, were, they didn't want me to audition because they said, no, Landis had said, he's a, he's a surfer or a cowboy, he's not preppy. A surf type? Why the f would I go for a surf type? For Otter, who's like the Gentile of the peas, it's like, no. Sir? I got to come in and audition. And then uh, Landis, after the second audition, you know, he took me outside and he says, I go, don't tell anybody about this. Don't, don't, I swear, you swear you won't tell anybody. I said, I swear. And he said, what? And he goes, you're going to get this part. You're going to get this part. I'm going to hire you for this movie. You know, he said, uh, but you can't tell anybody because it's just, you know, uh, the, your, your agents will hold up the studio. And I said, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. In successive fashion, Chinich brought in Peter Rieger to play the role of Boone, Karen Allen to play Boone's girlfriend, Katie, James Widows as Hoover, Bruce McGill as D-Day and Tom Hulse for the part of Pinto. Now all the fraternity needed was a hapless flounder. We were looking for a fat kid to play flounder. I was delivering pizzas in Hollywood and I delivered to studios and everything. And what Stephen did is whenever he delivered a pizza, he put his resume and picture in the pizza. When they opened the lid to the pizza box, there was my picture staring them right in the face. And I opened the pizza and there's a photo in there of this fat kid who had never acted in a movie before. So I don't remember the exact details, but I had Chinich call him up. And I went on an audition, and uh, it was so weird because I, I went in there, and there was like 50 guys that looked exactly like me. And I, because I thought I had the corner of the market of fat guys with curly hair. I think it got down to me and Meatloaf for the part of uh, Flounder. Acting one out in the end of the day, and, and that's sort of the way it went with everybody, including Kevin Bacon, who was not even in the Street Actors Guild. The casting director called me up and said, hey, uh, you got the movie. And I was like, wow, that's great, man, that's great. I was really excited. Once the principal cast was complete with young no-name actors, the studio became worried all over again. Basically, they were very unhappy with my casting. We had John, but of course the studio is going, well, John's a television actor, who else can you get? The time had come for Landis to play the ace in his pocket, a big name star who would act in the movie and could make the studio happy once and for all. I had known Donald Sutherland since I was 17 and a mailboy at Fox when they were shooting MASH. And as a favor, he had been in Kentucky Fried Movie. Donald Sutherland as the clumsy waiter. Don was a big star at that time. And I thought of him for the part of uh, Jennings, the teacher. He was perfect. Yeah, there they are. When they started negotiating the deal for Sutherland, they offered him $10,000 and a percentage of the movie. And he said, uh, I don't want any percentage of the movie. He said, I, I want $25,000.
I think we figured out it to this day would be worth about four or five million dollars. He tells that story often, too. Coming up, the fraternity brothers get in a rumble. Jamie ended up getting his teeth knocked out. Welcome back to Unseen Untold on Spike TV. Yes, you can. And what time? In 10 minutes. <laughs> Run! <laughs> In October of 1977, 27-year-old John Landis set out to make his first studio film. <laughs> Ivan Reitman, this is Ivan Reitman, hey, the producer hey, of Animal House. Hey. Alongside rookie Hollywood producers Maddie Simmons and Ivan Reitman, the trio begin searching for the perfect college location to film Animal House. And we got turned down everywhere. I think we got turned down at 12 different universities in about six different states. They read the script and, and you know, threw it back in our face. But then we checked out the University of Oregon at, in Eugene, and we got very, very lucky. The dean, who was named William Boyd at the time, like Hopalong Cassidy, but different, he had uh, been given the script of The Graduate and thought it was filth and said, there's no way you can shoot here. Fortunately for us, having turned down the graduate and being very sorry about it, he decided that he would allow us to, uh, to shoot there without actually checking out the script. Thank God. While the University of Oregon began transforming into Faber College, the cast and crew packed up and moved to Eugene so they could prepare for production. They brought us all up a week before we started shooting to do absolutely nothing, to just hang out together and get to become friends. It wasn't so much rehearsing as bonding. I wanted to come together as a group, which they did. I mean, you know all the graffiti in the Delta House? They did it. Um, they all got their haircuts together by the local barber in Eugene. And they did bond. And then all of a sudden, the Omegas showed up, you know, I mean, and, uh, and we treated them like dirt. I remember this because I felt so bad, but like two days before filming, or a day or two before filming, when uh, Jim Doughton, who plays Greg Marmalard, and Kevin Bacon, who plays Chip Diller, and Mark Metcalf, who plays Niedermeyer, showed up, they were all around a big table, all the Deltas in uh, the dining room at the Roadway Inn, where we were staying. And the Omegas walked in, I said, hey guys, it's the Omegas. And everybody went, F you, boo! And this wall of food flew at them. Food fight! <laughs> they were like, we're all actors together, bam, you know. A food fight between the Deltas and the Omegas may have helped the actors get into character, but it was a real-life fist fight that actually brought this fraternity together. A couple of the students invited us uh, to a fraternity party on the Saturday night before we were going to start shooting on Monday. I mean, I'd never been in a fraternity. Nobody else, I think, had been in a fraternity. So, yeah, sure. And we were into this thing about being these Hollywood actors, you know. You're going to get laid. You're going to have a good time. Tim had some sort of, you know, movie star thing going for him. And, um... One of the girlfriends of one of the main guys at the fraternity immediately started flirting with Tim. I was wearing like his camel hair coat, you know, and these guys were all like, you know. Tim came over to me and he said, uh, I don't think we ought to be. I, I'm getting a really bad feeling about this place. There's this sort of weird little vibe that starts going on up there. I quickly sensed that Tim was right, and I said, you're absolutely right. It was like lines out of the movie, practically. So everybody's, everybody's filing out, and finally, this one guy who's standing by the door, sort of, who had been downstairs with me the whole time, giving me all this crap, um, uh, as I get to the door, he says something like, you know, you know, buy or buy, you know, or whatever, something like that. And he's holding his cup of beer here. And I just took my hand and I popped it right in his face. Well, wow. <laughs> Jamie takes this beer and just throws it in the guy's face. And within like an instant, it's chaos. I mean, these fraternity brothers in this house are pouring down the stairs. That started the melee. I mean, it was like a wave hit us. Like that, it was just like that. There goes Peter Rieger, airborne, smash. There goes, the girls aren't thrown out, but they're now screaming, stop, we'll stop, you animals, you animals, stop. There's about 15 of them trying to beat the crap out of Tim. Everybody just turned on me, and it was like, oh my God. 
I had a bunch of guys on me, and that's, I got kicked in the mouth. They have Bruce McGill on the ground, and they're kicking him in the ribs. I kept her hearing Karen yelling, they've got Tim, they've got Tim. And then I saw Bruce charging back in to get Tim. Boom, bang, they're pounding in the back of our heads. We're down again. I look over, I say, Timmer, we're going to have to run. He says, yep. Jesus Christ. happened? You look grotesque. Oh, some of the Omegas did a little dance on my face. And when we got back to the hotel, uh, the motel, we were in Tim's room, I think, and it was 2 o'clock in the morning. We all had sort of wandered in after various trips to hospitals and doctors. And Jamie ended up getting his teeth knocked out. McGill's got a just a classic black eye. It's just, you know, award-winning. I had cuts on my head because I was doing, like, rope a I was screaming at these guys so loudly that, I mean, they weren't attacking me, but I was screaming that I had laryngitis for about two days. It made us a fraternity. It was really, uh, you couldn't have planned it. So I guess basically, uh, quite unconsciously, I'm responsible for the camaraderie. <laughs> I'm responsible for the success of this movie. With the cast both bonded and bandaged, the crew moved forward with production. Over the course of a 31-day shoot period, this mythical fraternity of actors known as Delta Tau Chi continued to rewrite the college handbook on how to eat, drink, and how to throw a party. When we were writing the movie, we, we said, should it be a toga party? At one point, we were weighing the difference between should it be a Fiji Island party, where everyone dresses up like in grass skirts with bones in their noses, <laughs> or should it be a toga party? You guys up for a toga party? Toga! Toga! People could have been yelling Fiji, Fiji, for all I know. The toga party with Otis Day and the Knights was shot to mimic the party's Chris Miller's fraternity had thrown at Dartmouth in the early 1960s. You never make me wanna... basement where Otis Day and the Knights performed, but was very hot in there with the lights. And those were college students and the cast, and uh, it was fun. Thank God I had a tie on, because it made it totally ridiculous. Now wait a minute. I remember my job on that day was to help choreograph the band. I'd like to take credit for everybody going down on the ground on the little bit softer section of that song. We were down shaking like that. We did this two days for 12 hours a day. If I ever get anything like that again, I'm going to do a slow step, man. Do a nice, easy step. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Of all the manic moments that make up Animal House, there were a few scenes John Landis was forced to cut out, including this never-before-seen blooper of John himself portraying a cafeteria worker. But the first scene to get cut was a vomit story from the original script that was so nasty, the filmmakers wouldn't even shoot it. It was a lampoon tale called The Night of the Seven Fires. The seven fires were literally seven bonfires that had been built, which go up the hill. They had to go up and throw up, drink a lot of beer and throw up on all the fires to put them out. Now, one of the tricky things about making a movie about fraternities is that for most of the world, a lot of what goes on at fraternities is not particularly likable. A couple of years later, along came Monty Python and The Meaning of Life and another film called Stand By Me, which had booting sequences in them. Would Monsieur care for an aperitif or would he prefer to order straight away? We missed our chance to uh, be the first in there with that joke. And I have always been sorry that... Uh, we missed that chance. When Unseen Untold returns, the animals are unleashed upon America. You're watching Unseen Untold, National Lampoon's Animal House on Spike TV.
We are in Cottage Grove, Oregon, which is about 15 or 20 miles from Eugene, Oregon, and the University of Oregon. Oregon, thank you. And we're filming the parade sequence, thank you, for National Lampoon's Animal House, opening August 1978 at a theater or drive-in near you. After production on Animal House wrapped in November of 1977, the actors that made up Delta Tau Chi each went their separate ways. But eight months later, the frat brothers were summoned together to New York City for what would be their most important meeting, the movie's premiere. I got an invitation to the premiere, and I didn't get a date because I figured I am going to score so heavily at this premiere because I am in this picture, you know. I'm gonna be just, set them up, boys, because I'm just gonna knock them down. They picked us up in limousines, which was, the only time I had ridden in the limousine was somebody who was dead. I walked towards the theater, and here it is, this movie I'm in, and the lights, and they had search lights and the whole thing. And I get up, and there's a rope, and I see a red carpet. It was just an amazing thing, and then coming out of the car and all the flash bulbs coming, it, this was a, this is a dream. And I get into the movie theater, and I've got the wrong ticket. I got the ticket that says I gotta sit in the back. I don't have like the, you know, like the good tickets. And the guy's like, you can't sit here. I'm like, yeah, but I'm in the movie. I'm with those guys. He's like, oh, you can't sit here. The curtains opened and the lights dropped. It was time to sit back and enjoy the show. It was like a rock concert uh, where people just um, laugh from beginning to end. They must have applauded 40 or 50 times. I got concerned about a guy across the aisle who was like, like it, it's like he couldn't stop and things were not even happening that were that funny, but he was just so tickled and he changed colors and he was like writhing like he was having uh, the bends. I couldn't hear half the lines because there was so much laughter in the audience and I'm thinking, wow, maybe, maybe this is good. The true test would soon come. On July 28, 1978, Animal House opened to audiences across America. It was a huge success. I don't know if any of us knew that we were making a hit. It was the country that told us how important the movie is. We didn't tell them how important it was. One week, Belushi, I think, was on the cover of Time magazine and maybe Newsweek. I mean, he was on, like, the cover of all the national magazines. I drove to Westwood to see the movie with John Landis, and there was a line around the block in Westwood, California. I'm going, my goodness, this is incredible. They're, they're standing in line. They're actually paying four bucks to see me. People got into it and liked it and saw it again and again and again. This is a phenomenon. It is bigger. It's as big as we'd all hoped it would be. It, was, it realized all of our wildest dreams. As the Animal House frenzy grew, it became clear that the movie would impact American culture. Ah, thanks. I needed that. Well, ironically, it brought the Greek system back with a vengeance. I had no idea that this was going to become a national craze. I would get phone calls from colleges in which they were having a toga party. Big schools, Ohio, Michigan. There'd be 10,000 people at a toga party. They'd have them in stadiums. It was insane. And there would be a phone hookup. You know, we have Boone on the phone. And I'd say something into the assembled crowd. And you would hear a roar of thousands of people screaming. Goddamn son of a bitch, I'll kill you, scumbag jerk off. In a matter of months, the story that nobody wanted to touch had become the hottest movie in America. As a result, a slew of college-based television spin-offs hit the airwaves. CBS launched Coed Fever, NBC came out with Brothers and Sisters, and the writers, producers, and several of the stars from Animal House reunited to put their efforts into ABC's sitcom Delta House. We were the one group that could have actually called it Animal House, and for some strange reason, the network or the studio thought Delta House was a better title. It never seemed right, right from the beginning. I'm the only one who said no, because you can't, you know, especially then there was no cable TV, you couldn't be truthful to the material, and I said it would be watered down and, and damaged, which is, it was. They wouldn't let me have them drinking beer on camera. They wouldn't let me have a boy and girl sit on a bed together. They wouldn't let me do a lot of things. The thing I remember the most about Delta House was the girl they cast, the young unknown Michelle Pfeiffer, a checkout girl from Orange County. She said, 
what will I do about my job? I said, what do you do? She said, I work the checkout counter at Vaughn's supermarket. So I said, you're out of the grocery business forever. And that was Michelle Pfeiffer. And she was on Delta House, and that's where she spoke her first lines as an actress. Uh, I knew you'd understand. And we can still be friends, of course. Pals forever. And you can keep my pin. No. Robert, I think you ought to have this back. Let's make it a clean break. Despite the Delta House flop, Animal House the movie had raked in over $120 million at the box office. So it didn't take long before Universal's once skeptical studio heads came begging for more. Sequel talks began right almost within six months. And that was before sequels were as popular as they are today. Boy, they tried to write a sequel to Animal House a dozen times, maybe two dozen times. But there was a difference of opinion of how to make it. I wanted to make it one way, other people wanted to make it another way. The problem was we could never find a way to take those same characters in that same situation and create as magical an experience. The original group of writers were going to write one that was going to be set five years later in Haight-Ashbury. The, the great seven Delta brothers were going to come together and have the same kind of adventures in hippiedom. And then John Belushi died. And that, that killed it forever, because there could be no sequel to Animal House without John Belushi. When Spike TV returns, the cast and crew of Animal House remember their favorite moments. <laughs> Watching Unseen Untold, National Lampoon's Animal House on Spike TV. Animal House first burst onto the scene and captivated audiences 25 years ago. And still, the film remains a classic. Well, Peter Bogdanovich said that the only true test of a movie is time. So the fact that 25 years later, the movie still cracks people up, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. Mr. Dorfman. Hello. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. Animal House is truly film's original frat house. And like all good fraternities, it's left itself a legacy. It's paved the way for campus comedies like Porky's and Fast Times, Road Trip, American Pie, and Old School. It's inspired the folks of Cottage Grove, Oregon to reenact the famous parade scene. And it's created a party ritual still heard echoing in colleges across America. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! I can't tell you. Over the last 25 years, how many people have stopped me and said, I did that. I know those people. I was that kid. I was in that fraternity. <laughs> what makes Animal House different from other campus classics is what it means to those who made it. Their experiences on the set, their favorite scenes, and the memories they have in creating history. I actually love the scene when we're smoking dope together, when Peter and I are in the bathtub, and I love Donald Sutherland and Tommy Hulse's conversation about the atom. One tiny atom in my fingernail could be, could be one little tiny universe. It's not going to be an orgy. It's a toga party. I just remember this was a great time. I remember trying to convince Karen how important our screen kiss was at the end of the movie. And she kept looking at me like, what is this guy trying to get away with? And all I kept saying was, that's, you know, this is movie kisses. You know, they're famous, so we got to, like, really get in there. And she kept looking at me like, what are you talking about? It's just, and I said, no, no, this is very serious. So if you want to rehearse, and she said, I, I know how to kiss. We don't have to rehearse. Fawn Leibowitz. Fawn Leibowitz, and she was from Fort Wayne, Indiana. I hope I score. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. The one scene I vividly remember the most was the Fawn Leibowitz date with, the, you know, the girls from the Emily Dickinson Girls the School for Girls. I just remember thinking, this is the most perfect scene that I've ever been in. It's it's like having the great inside joke. Hi, I'm Frank Lyman from Amherst, Fawn's fiance. Her. Well, well, actually, we're, we're engaged to be engaged. It was like a great sports moment, you know? You can just see the big, slow curve coming at you, and you go, here it comes. Why don't we sit down, Frank? It was one of those things, just don't do too much, just don't fall down, and it'll be fabulous. Sophomore dies in kill an explosion. <laughs> <laughs> she made a she made a pot for me. I, she was gonna make a pot for me. Oh, if there's anything I can do, 
Would you go out with me? I'll get my coat. And could you get three dates for my friends? No, I think some of my favorite memories are to do with Belushi. Ladies and gentlemen, John Belushi. John Landis had great respect for Belushi's talent, and so he often would just put Belushi in a situation and encourage him to, you know, improvise, to do things, to try things. Ladies and gentlemen, intense fear. More intense. Much more terror. Absolute hey! assurance. Very confident. Extremely. Hey, hey, Mr. Big Man on campus. How are you? How are you? <laughs> anger. Real anger. Can't spend your whole life worrying about your mistakes. You fucked up. You trusted us. The hardest scene for me to do was probably the very last scene that I filmed was when John Belushi was trying to cheer me up. It was the last day of shooting. I couldn't stop laughing. Remain calm. All is well. The flattening part, that was, that was great. It was the last thing that I shot. Remain calm. I was filled with this incredible sadness of the experience being over. And although it was only a few weeks out of my life, I, I felt like I had had this, like, sort of monumental experience. You know, you, there's this thing that happens when you make movies. I mean, they almost become these little set pieces in your life. And they have a beginning, and you meet everybody, and then you get sort of close, and you have good things and bad things happen to you, and then, and then they end. It was the first time that I've ever experienced that. And, uh, I mean, it's crazy to think in that, in that scene that I would be a sad scene. But when I see it, I, I feel very sad. Nobody could have predicted that this tainted tale about college camaraderie would hold such a place in cinema history. But one thing's for sure, with every new year comes a fresh new audience looking for a good laugh. <laughs> To a wide audience, we really introduced a new form of comedy, which is today's comedy, and that's more or less black comedy. And what Animal House did that was radical was it took all the characters who in earlier movies were the heroes and made them the bad guys. And it took all the crazies and the nuts and the Martians and the womanizers and the animals and raised them to some sort of mythic godhood of being the good guys. And that was what people went crazy over. So we were making a small little movie that took off, and that was very exciting. And of course it was unexpected. It didn't expect it at all, but it was great. I'm really proud of that movie. I'm proud to be in it. Uh, you know, how fortunate we all were to be in it. And, and what, a good, what a good group of people that, that they put together. It was a good experience for everybody, and it was really fun. So we had a wonderful time making it, and I think it does reflect in the film the sense of fraternity and fun. Joe don't know. When will he find out? It's a reality show that's not real. The Joe Schmo Show. Tuesdays at 9. This place is starting to drive me crazy. Only on Spike TV.